I'm Jeff Fritz with Soundstage.com, and I'm joined today by Lawrence Dickey. He is the technical director of Vivid Audio. Lawrence, how are you today? Hey, thanks, Jeff. No, I'm great. Thank you. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about loudspeaker drive units. And for those of you that don't know, Lawrence, he designs all the drivers for the Vivid Audio loudspeakers. And by the way, Vivid Audio is located in South Africa. That's where most of their manufacturing is done. But Lawrence is joining us today from the UK. And I think, I think you said that your smallest loudspeaker is now manufactured uh, in the location that we're broadcasting from. Is that correct? Yeah, actually, Jeff, that's absolutely true. Um, for all sorts of historical reasons, we decided to give a little bit of manufacturing a go. And actually, I'm really enjoying having, uh, I call it a heartbeat of manufacture going on in the background, because otherwise, until now, it's been just rather dry R&D. But to actually have a daily routine of folks coming in and actually manufacturing products, it makes quite a novel difference. Well, that's that's pretty exciting news. I think, uh, you know, when people think about Vivid Audio loudspeakers, they think about probably first and foremost the GIA, which is, you know, a fairly large loudspeaker. But uh, I think you're referring to the S12, which is a, uh, I see a pair just in the background there, actually. That is <laughs> so I guess that's quite manageable. But hey, listen, what I wanted to talk to you about today was uh, loudspeaker drive units. And I know that you have a history in both professional applications and obviously with Vivid and prior to that B&W consumer applications uh, designing drive units for loudspeakers and can you just give us a little bit about your history with loudspeaker drive unit manufacture and design? Yeah sure Jeff. Okay well it really started at B&W when I was put onto the project that would eventually uh, result in the Nautilus and at first uh, my quest was to see what I could do to improve the environment in which the loudspeaker existed. And that at the time, of course, BMW was a Kevlar driver. But what, what I came to realize was actually the shortcomings of the Kevlar driver were letting the whole thing down. And what, having removed all cabinet effects, um, you could hear the nature of the cone in the Kevlar. So I began to uh, develop new, uh, new drivers based on uh, metal stones. So that was um, the beginning, really, of my career in driver design. Okay. And so for Vivid Audio today, you know, and, and for those of you uh, that, that read Soundstage and the Soundstage website, I have an Ultra Audio or a Soundstage Ultra opinion coming out on the first that talks about drive units. And, you know, that's kind of where we hooked up into this conversation about you know, how important the drive unit is to the loudspeaker. Obviously, you know, we're hearing the drive unit itself. And I wanted to, to find out from you, you know, as a designer that, that basically covers from, from soup to nuts, right, the, the, the manufacture and design of the drive units all the way up through the finished loudspeaker, what kind of advantage does it give you to be able to design the drive unit for the ground up for a specific Vivid Audio loudspeaker? You know, the, the most important thing about being in this position is that I can tinker with something to my heart's content. I don't have to explain it to myself or account for my uh, changes to another manufacturer. I can just give it a go and see what happens. And also, sometimes you can have an accidental uh, modification to the design which actually improves the performance. There was a famous case of somebody who put a screwdriver through uh, the diaphragm of a driver and uh, noticed an improvement in performance. And of course, um, if you're making the drivers as well, uh, then it's easy to take that from an experiment, from an idea to uh, a, a finished model. And uh, I, I find that a tremendous advantage. Lawrence, what type of challenges have you had in designing drive units for the Vivid speakers? I know you know, from a reviewer standpoint, we see press materials and marketing materials all the time that talk about, you know, cone breakup or thermal compression or all of these, you know, technical issues that designers face when designing drive units. What, what specifically or specific challenges have you had designing the drive units for the Vivid Audio loudspeakers? Yeah, um, 
cone breakup, I mean, de generally diaphragm breakup is the biggest uh, challenge. And, um, and being sure that that's consistent, obviously it depends very much on the, uh, the material that comes in, the aluminum foil that we use, the consistent thickness and that type of factor. Of course, we don't have control over the, the rolling of the foil, the variations in, uh, in the material can be an issue. And all too often, um, you know, we'll only realize that there's been a, a shift in the specification when we've got a whole batch of material in. Um, but you know, otherwise, I have to say that um, moving to metal diaphragms, as we have completely, has resulted in a much more consistent performance than I remember from previous experience with companies using, uh, should I say, more organic material, be, be they woven textiles or um, pulp cones, which are the, you know, the workhorse of uh, most loud speaking manufacturers. So actually, I'm pretty happy with our decision to use uh, alloy foil components. As I say, apart from a little variation in thickness, really, they're very consistent. And having control over the drive unit in the design phase of the loudspeaker, what, what kind of advantages does that give you versus, say, buying an off-the-shelf driver and then trying to design around it to produce a finished loudspeaker? Well, <laughs> you know, this takes me right back to the beginning of um, my work with Vivid Audio. Before I'd actually met my partners in South Africa and I was on, a, on an exploratory mission after leaving BMW, um, and I designed uh, what was to become the trio of drivers that we know as the B260, 50, and C125. The, the two dome drivers uh, were a departure in their uh, manufacturing technique. So, whereas most of the time uh, manufacturers have a dome which goes over the former of the voice coil, I decided that it would be more practical because the former length in the voice coil is perhaps one of the less tightly controlled. Uh, variables, or at least the, the position of the voice coil on the former isn't so tightly controlled. And it's, I figured that um, if you were to have the dome on the inside of the voice coil former, then you could actually set the height of the dome relative to the coil. Uh, similarly, uh, with the surround on the outside. Um, and then when I presented this approach to OEM drivers, uh, sorry, OEM driver manufacturers, they all threw up their hands and said, but that's not the way we make drivers. And <laughs> that was really the end of the discussion. We, I, I couldn't get those uh, traditional suppliers to make drivers for me. So when I met uh, uh, Philip uh, Gutenberg back in the year 2000, and uh, we talked about starting a loudspeaker manufacturing company, and I said to him, you know, to make this thing really interesting, we should be making the drivers as well. And, uh, I have to say, it, we took that on, you know, um, there were some hurdles to, uh, to volley for sure, but the most important thing is I was able to make my drivers, uh, as some would say, inside out, and no one was questioning my approach. We just went on and did it. And I have to say, it worked very well. The other advantage of that approach at the time was because we used this carbon fiber stiffening ring, Again, a thing which most manufacturers just aren't interested in because it's very much a hands-on uh, process. But for us, it was an, a fairly straightforward uh, additional process. And um, as I say, it, it's another aspect which makes our drivers quite unique. And we could not have done that just using traditional OEM suppliers. So one question that I have, Lawrence, that I've been curious about, when you're in the the design phase of a, of a loudspeaker, do you tackle the drivers first or is it, a, is it a process where you're designing the speaker and the driver simultaneously? Uh, how, does that, how, does, how does that work exactly? Um, if we look at the Vivid Audio range specifically, um, as I said, it started with the D50 D26 driver, and then the C125. 
And these drivers I optimized for uh, a couple of frequency bands. And the way in which we use those drivers in enclosure varies, but there is no real need to change the drivers themselves. They are broadly applicable to a, a whole range of designs. So we'll find the D50 uh, throughout the gear range, the D26 indeed, our standard tweeter is used in all our products. There is no need to customize it to any specific uh, product. The only thing about the D26 is that whereas in the uh, original oval series and the gear series where uh, the dome is effectively in the side, directly in the side of the cylinder, uh, with the um, V1.5 and now the Kaya range, the tweeter is actually uh, in a shallow waveguide and that waveguide has to part right next to the dome. So that one subtle difference means that the molding for the tweeter uh, does, we do have two versions of the tweeter depending on whether it's going to be just on the side of the cylinder or if it's going to be in a shallow waveguide. But otherwise, uh, those drivers are pretty consistent. There is no need to tweak them for the specific system design. The base units, of course, are a different thing. And you know, so much about a speaker, a finished speaker system design, is actually dictated by the base units. The size of the enclosure, well, that's it really, the size of the enclosure uh, is uh, appropriate, is mapped to the size of the uh, driver radiating area, and of course, the lowest frequency extension that you're interested in. Um, pretty much the mids and highs just plop into place above them. Um, so, yeah, I would say, uh, broadly speaking, you have a, a, a standard range of drivers and you fit those into the, uh, the application, the relevant application. Um, I know that other manufacturers uh, may have a different mid-range drivers for every application, but I'm not sure that's strictly necessary. So, Lawrence, the last question that I have for you, and you mentioned the Kaya range, uh, you know, as being your newest products, and I see there you have a pair of S12s behind you. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you're hearing? I see you've got a system set up, and uh, what do you hear from the S12s yourself? What, what do you like about that speaker? Um, well, it, <laughs> I'll say it myself, but um, I'm really pleasantly surprised. <laughs> it sounds like a larger loudspeaker. Uh, okay, I made the decision. A small loudspeaker like this would quite frequently you'd tune the bottom end of the port frequency to maybe 50 hertz or even higher. Um, but I chose to tune it to a proper 40 hertz, which means that, you know, it's the bottom ear of a bass guitar. Now, admittedly, it does mean it is a small enclosure. It does mean that uh, there is a sort of one or two dB slope down to that corner frequency. But what's really important is that if you do put a bottom E through the middle S12, um, the port does its job, the cone excursion is reasonable, the result is that you get a pretty full bottom end. Um, and yeah, the overall impression is a, a, perhaps a larger loudspeaker than you see with your eyes. Um, now, the other thing about the S12 is what we're doing inside it to tame the usual uh, mid-range resonance that you tend to get inside a small enclosure. And I think they're all working really rather well. The speaker is clean right up to the, right, right up through the mid-range. And then, of course, it hands over to the D20 tweeter. Well, that's got a long track record of so no surprises there. But uh, no, the rest of the thing is working really very satisfactorily. <laughs> Well, Lawrence, I really appreciate your time and particularly your 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 insight not only on driver manufacture, but uh, you know how it fits into the finished design, and then and then also the the S12. I know that we have some articles coming coming out across the soundstage sites uh, shortly on the S12, and uh, you know it's a it's a very accessible loudspeaker to a lot of people, and you know I think hearing from you that it sounds larger than it is and knowing that it's fairly compact so it 
can fit into a lot of spaces and also, you know, frankly, into a lot of budgets. Uh, but it's still a vivid yeah. loudspeaker. I think that's a pretty, pretty exciting proposition. That's absolutely the thing I didn't say. It is very definitely you hear it and think, yeah, it's a vivid loudspeaker. <laughs> Well, great. Well, Lawrence, thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy your weekend. Thank you. You too, Jeff. Nice to chat.